High up in the Martian sky, circling the red planet, are two of the strangest moons in the whole solar system, Phobos and Deimos. Phobos and Deimos are Mars's constant companions, a pair of siblings carrying ancient names for fear and panic, a fitting match for a planet named after the Roman god of war. Yet it's a far more prosaic emotion that scientists often feel when contemplating them. Confusion. Confusion because Phobos and Deimos defy all logic. Unbelievably small compared to our moon, they are so microscopic that it was long believed that they were a pair of rogue asteroids captured by Mars's gravity. But recent research has shown they're almost certainly made up of the same material as the red planet. And that raises a fascinating question. How did they get there? Too small to have formed alongside Mars or been created by an impact, the siblings as past is the subject of both intense debate and an upcoming mission by Japan's JAXA. A mission that could help us unlock not just the past of these strange moons, but that of Mars itself. When discussing Phobos and Deimos, there's one fact people keep circling back to time and again, how unbelievably small they are. With a diameter of just 22 kilometers, Phobos is barely a pebble, yet it's still the larger of the two. Deimos barely clocks in at 12 kilometers across, the sort of distance you might casually run after a day's work to blow off some steam. Now compare them with our moon. With a diameter of 3,474 kilometers, Earth's satellite is over 150 times bigger, like a Comparing two chihuahuas to a Great Dane that's been crossbred with a Lovecraftian elder god. To be fair, our moon is unusually big compared to Earth's size, but even if we change the criteria to include every natural satellite in the solar system, Phobos and Deimos would still rank among the very smallest. To find other moons of such diminutive stature, you'd need to look at the tiniest ones orbiting Saturn and Jupiter, yet those are all accompanied by vastly bigger objects like Titan and Ganymede. Phobos and Deimos, by contrast, are just drifting on their own. Two siblings orbiting high above Mars with no friends or family to keep them company. And just like regular siblings, they seem to revel in accentuating their differences. Let's start by looking at the bigger of the two. Phobos. Pottering around the red planet at just 6,000 kilometers above the surface, Phobos holds the slightly lame record of closest satellite to its home planet. At such low altitudes, it's able to orbit Mars three times a day, a fact that will lead to some bizarre sights for future colonists. According to Astronomy Magazine, Phobos visibly waxes and wanes during each appearance. Imagine for a second how utterly trippy it would feel if you stepped outside, glanced at the night sky, and watched in stoned amazement as our moon went from a crescent to a half to a full moon right before your eyes. Well, that's kind of what Phobos does. Across all three of its four hour-long appearances, it noticeably seems to grow and shrink. By the way, that's three appearances that you'd be able to see in all their glory. So bright and so close to Mars, Phobos is normally visible even in daylight. Still, it's small enough that its main features would be hard to make out, even for an astronaut with 20-20 vision. No. To get a real feel for the moon, you'd have to go whizzing up there for a closer look, at which point things would get weird. While visually, Phobos is fairly interesting, with its vast Stickney crater that makes up about half of the moon's surface, surface features would probably be the last thing on your mind. As soon as you touch down, you'd feel for yourself just how weak the moon's gravity is, about a thousandth as strong as Earth's. Move too forcefully, and you'd risk pushing yourself off the surface and away into space. Now, obviously, getting accidentally sent careening into the void would not be ideal, but neither would be staying on Phobos. The temperature changes on the Martian moon are brutal. On the sunny side, things oh, would feel like a sunny January day in Prague, shivering minus four Celsius. Over on the night side, by contrast, they'd plunge to the sort of temperatures that would make Canadians cry, Siberians reach for their vodka, and brass monkeys start wailing. We're talking minus 112 degrees Celsius here. Yeah? all just a short walk from the sunny side. According to NASA, such fast heat loss as the surface slips into shadow is unusual. Per the agency, it's, quote, likely a result of the fine dust on Phobos' surface, which is unable to retain heat. Produced by millions of years of asteroid bombardments, that dust would also be a nightmare. Getting inside your instruments and generally making science stuff a bit of a nightmare to do. Not that you'd be any better off if you decided to visit Deimos. Chilling out over 18,000 kilometers higher than its sibling, Deimos is invisible from Mars in the daytime and appears 
appears to be a mere spot of light at night. With an orbit of 30 hours, its journey seems strange from the Martian surface, visible for several nights in a row before disappearing altogether, then reappearing again. According to Astronomy Magazine, quote, it remains above the horizon for about 60 hours at a time, moving slowly from east to west, while Phobos appears to zip from west to east. For anyone stood on Deimos, though, it would seem just as barren and as dusty as Phobos. NASA thinks the regolith could be up to 100 meters deep, so deep it has filled in many of the craters and made the moon appear. Still, the fact we know any of this is truly remarkable. For most of human history, we had no idea Mars had any moons at all. If Las Vegas had been a thing in the early 17th century, Johannes Kepler's powers of prediction could have won him a small fortune there. As far as we know, Kepler was the first human in history to assert that Mars had two moons. Although that's not because he had an unnaturally powerful telescope that allowed him to glimpse them. Kepler was simply throwing out a hypothesis based on the recent discovery of Jupiter's four largest moons. If Earth had one satellite and Jupiter four, his thinking went, then maybe the planet between them had two. That he turned out to be right was basically down to luck. Still, it would be another two and a half centuries before anyone realized how on the money Kepler's guess had been. The year was 1877. By this point, just about every planet beyond Earth had at least one confirmed moon. Jupiter was still thought to have four, while eight had so far been sighted orbiting Saturn. Four space hemorrhoids had been spotted clinging to Uranus, while Neptune was known to have at least one. That just left Mars as the weirdo in the planetary party. It was the only moonless wonder beyond Earth's orbit. But at Saffhall wasn't so sure the red planet was alone. Having calculated its mass, the American astronomer was certain there must be some missing moons out there, visible only in the way their faint gravity affected other objects. With Mars due to reach its closest point to Earth that summer, Hall decided to try and find them. For several nights in a row, he waited at the observatory, hoping for the clouds to break. When they didn't, he very nearly gave up, only to be told by his wife to keep on looking. The very next night, the atmosphere cleared, and Hall finally saw it. The faint pinprick of light following Mars on its journey across the heavens. Two days later, he spotted another. It was the first time in history anyone had laid eyes on Phobos and Deimos. The first time anyone realized that Mars, known to humans since ancient times, had companions. This revelation was only somewhat spoiled by the heated custody battle that followed. The director of the observatory, Simon Newcomb, wrote to the New York Times, basically being like, guess what? I just discovered Martian moons. As of all, who's that guy? Never heard of him. Fights of credit aside, though, this was the moment when our relationship with these two adorable space pebbles began. One that arguably peaked in the 1970s as first Mariner 9 and then Voyager 2 transmitted back the clearest pictures yet. Well, at least that was the peak until this decade, but we'll come to why in a later chapter. For now, we want to move away from humanity's history with Phobos and Deimos and skip over to a far more controversial tale. The story of where the heck these weird little moons came from in the first place. At some point in the far-flung future, long after all of us are dead, Mars will lose its two companions. Phobos is gradually inching closer to the red planet, drifting further into its parents' embrace at a rate of 1.8 meters per year. Eventually, it will get so close that it will be destroyed, likely breaking up to form a ring around the fourth planet. Deimos, meanwhile, is edging slowly away, like a teenager eager to escape their mum's home, but not yet ready to quite give up all those free meals. One day, though, the time will come. Deimos will break free of Mars's gravity and head off into the void, ready to chart her own course in life. Considering we know the fate of these two moons, it can be tempting to assume that uh, we know their entire stories, from how they were born to how they would eventually die. But that's not the case. While we're confident uh, we know where the siblings are headed, we're still in the dark about where they came from. Because of their diminutive size, Phobos and Deimos were long assumed to be captured asteroids, remnants of the solar system's early days that had been caught by Mars's gravity during some bygone era of chaos. Speaking to the New York Times in 2020, JPL planetary scientist Abigail Freeman summed up the then common theory. They check all the boxes that are consistent with them being these captured asteroids. Moons that were once asteroids or other objects are not uncommon in our solar system. Jupiter and Saturn both have a few. Neptune's giant moon Triton is thought to be a captured dwarf planet from the Kuiper Belt. The trouble is, captured objects always have weird or eccentric orbits, looping around their host in a staggering, non nonsensical dance. Phobos and Deimos, by contrast, are both clinging to the equatorial plane in a staid, sensible fashion. So perfectly aligned with Mars that it 
just can't be a coincidence. As astrophysicist Ethan Siegel wrote for Big Think, if these are captured asteroids, it was an almost magical occurrence. Of course, just because something is improbable does not make it impossible. After all, it's a big old universe. Chances are some planet somewhere has captured two asteroids in a freakishly neat fashion. Maybe Mars was just their planet. But then came the Hope Mission, and the asteroid theory was dealt a possibly fatal blow. Launched by the United Arab Emirates in 2020, Hope is the first Mars orbiter by an Arab country, and as the UAE delights in pointing out, makes them only the fifth nation to successfully reach Mars. Although that accolade depends on either counting the USSR and Russia as the same nation or deliberately ignoring the two successful missions launched by the supranational European Space Agency. Regardless, it was still an impressive feat, but while Hope's original mission was to study Mars' atmosphere, its greatest find arguably came this spring. On April the 24th, 2023, UAE scientists released data and images taken from repeated flybys of Deimos, including one that came within 100 kilometers of the surface. Using three instruments to scan in infrared and ultraviolet, Hope had, in layman's terms, scienced the shit out of that moon. And what the probe had found a bit of shock. Rather than resembling the captured D-class asteroid everyone thought it was, Deimos represented nothing so much as a chunk of Mars. It appeared to be made of basalt, with none of the organics or minerals that we'd expect to find in a regular space rock. As the mission's science lead, Hesera Matroshi, told reporters, we don't believe that Deimos is an asteroid. These results still need to be confirmed by other craft. And it's worth noting that we have yet to send a dedicated probe to a D-class asteroid, meaning that we may be mistaken about how they look up close. Still, for now at least, the Hope mission seems to have killed the captured asteroid theory, which leaves two possible ways Phobos and Deimos came into being. Either they formed alongside Mars, or they were created by a giant impact. The trouble is, neither of those theories really make sense either. Now, back at the dawn of the solar system, the disk of material that surrounded our star began to form into clumps. Clumps that began to create their own gravitational pull on the debris around them. Some of those eventually grew to protoplanets of such density that they accrued their own separate disks of material. From these smaller disks, yet more matter began to coalesce, eventually forming into moons. That seems to be the origin of many natural satellites in our solar system. Moons like Titan, Ganymede, Europa, Callisto, Titania, and more all appear to have been born this way, coming into being alongside the planet they're orbiting. Perhaps the same is true of Phobos and Deimos. Certainly, a slow formation like this would explain why they're orbiting Mars so near. The problem? This method of formation only seems to apply when the protoplanet in question has enough mass to completely dominate its region. We're talking monsters like Jupiter, Saturn, the ice giants. Mars is far too small and weedy for this to have been the case. To quote Ethan Siegel, Mars is too low in mass to have formed with moons around it. Luckily, there's another way for a planet to get a moon system via a gigantic impact. We know this because it's what happens here on Earth. Way back in the distant past, a Mars-sized planet known as Thea came crashing into our proto-world. So big was the impact that it basically smashed apart and jumbled up both planets, creating a mess that eventually cooled and coalesced into the moon that we see today. Perhaps then, a similar process gave birth to Mars's twins. You can probably guess the next word out of my mouth. It's but. But there's a huge problem with this theory too. According to calculations by JAXA, Deimos is orbiting too far away from Mars to have been caused by a giant impact. Nor is that the only issue. No matter how many simulations we run in supercomputers, we've never been able to create a scenario where a giant impact in Mars's early history leaves us with two small moons orbiting the red planet today. As Gemma Davidson of Arizona State University told Scientific American, it doesn't fit the models we have for what material from a giant impact would look like. So. That's it, right? The part where we simply declare Phobos and Deimos must have been made by witches and retire this channel in favor of, well, magic graphics or something. Well, no, not quite, because there is, you see, one potential other theory that might explain this mystery. A theory which states Phobos and Deimos may have once had another sibling, one who died long ago in a great cataclysm. This idea can be traced back to a 2016 paper by Pascal Rosenblatt and colleagues that appeared in Nature Geoscience. In a series of simulations, the team showed that an impact from a body smaller than Thea, but larger than the asteroid that KO'd the dinosaurs, would have thrown up enough debris to form a moon several hundred kilometers wide, very close to Mars. So big was this moon that its gravity would have influenced the remaining debris in such a way as to give rise to Phobos and Deimos further out. If that's the case, though, 
what happens? Why isn't this video all about Phobos and Deimos, plus that other giant Martian moon that everybody keeps talking about? Well, for that, we can look to the Martian basin, a gigantic depression roughly half the size of the planet, where the average elevation is five kilometers lower than on the rest of the surface. The theory goes that at some point, billions of years ago, the larger moon's orbit decayed so much that it fell onto Mars, creating the giant basin with its impact. Because they were further out, Phobos and Deimos were unaffected by their siblings' demise. Instead, they remained where they were, orbiting in positions that it would be impossible for them to have formed in alone, but which can be entirely explained by the existence of a long-dead sister. It's a nice theory! Of course, though, we won't be able to say for sure until we definitively prove what these moons are made of, whether they really are formally a part of Mars. Thankfully, there's an upcoming mission that should do exactly that. The idea of landing a craft on one of Mars's moons has been around since at least the 1980s. First, the Soviet Union, then modern Russia, tried to combine three times to send a craft to Phobos. Unfortunately, all three missions ended in embarrassing failure. Of these ill-fated voyages, the one that got the closest was the USSR's Phobos II in 1989. That craft was on the verge of deploying its landers down onto the Martian moon when a software error caused ground control to lose contact. At the other end of the scale, you have the Russian Federation's Phobos Grunt spacecraft. This was launched in 2012. That probe didn't even reach orbit, instead crashing down into the Pacific Ocean in a spray of national humiliation. So everyone at Japan's JAXA will be crossing their fingers that their attempt doesn't suffer the same fate. Known as the Martian Moon's Exploration Mission, or MMX, Japan's probe is currently set to launch in September of 2024, blasting off on a year-long journey to our cosmic neighbor. Once in orbit around Mars, it will start to line itself up with Phobos, eventually reaching orbit alongside the moon in 2026. It's at this point that things are gonna get really cool. On board the MMX probe will be a small lander built as a joint project between France and Germany. A tiny boxy little thing will be dropped down onto the surface of Phobos for a 100-day mission. Over the next three plus months, the rover will slowly crawl across the surface, giving us a ground's eye view of the place. This will only be the third moon in history that we've landed a dedicated craft on after our own moon and Saturn's Titan. So every image of the rover, known as Idafix, beams back will be a cause for celebration. Have we must emphasize that the journey really will be slow. Remember earlier uh, when we said that you could accidentally launch yourself into space in Phobos's weak gravity just by exerting yourself too hard? Well, what's true for you is also true for rovers. Go faster than 80 millimeters per second, equivalent to 0.28 kilometers per hour, and Idafix will cease being a rover and instead become a piece of space junk orbiting Mars. That means the rover's 100-day mission will see it cover less than 100 meters in total, enough to do some cool science and take some awesome pictures, but perhaps not quite worth the $417 million Japan is planning to spend on MMX. Luckily, the French and German rover is just the start. When the Europeans are done having fun, the real meat of the mission will begin. The MMX probe will descend onto Phobos' surface, where it will grab 10 grams of material from two different locations. Remember the recent OSIRIS-REx mission to the asteroid Bennu? The one that used a pneumatic sampler to grab a chunk of space rock and fly back to Earth? Well, MMX will be attempting to do exactly that with Phobos. Building on tech JAXA used for their own Hayabusa 2 asteroid sample return mission, the probe will snatch a chunk of the Martian moon before sending it zooming back through the void to Earth for analysis. All being well, the sample will touch down in the Australian desert in 2029. The first time in history we'll be able to study up close material from a moon other than our own. Not that JAXA scientists will be hoping to find material only from Phobos. So close to Mars, it's thought that Phobos has, over its lifetime, collected material from the red planet, bits of ejecta blown into orbit by meteor impacts, traces of Martian rocks and soil. That means the capsule MMX sends back to Australia may, in fact, include another first. The first Martian rocks to ever be brought to Earth for study, beating NASA's own Mars sample return mission by over two years. What stories those rocks might be able to tell us are something we can right now only dream of. So, well, that's the story of Phobos and Deimos, two moons named for fear and panic, which may soon, instead, offer us a far more profound emotion. Hope. Hope that we can at last learn the origin of these two unusual satellites. Hope that we may be able to really get a fragment of Martian rock back to Earth to study. Hope that as the new space race heats up, we'll be seeing more and more of these amazing missions. Missions that will take us to places in our solar system we never even dreamed of. Places like Phobos, Deimos, the two most underrated space pebbles in existence.